Hello and welcome to the ArtsLink Assembly 2021. Here we are at least sitting in a room together, but live streaming uh, around the world, so welcome. I'm joining you from Lenape Hoking, which is the uh, native land of the Lenape people, uh, and we pay respects to the, uh, to the indigenous communities whose land we now occupy. The ArtsLink Assembly, as you probably know, is our annual meeting when we bring together transnational artists, curators, and arts workers. And this session is really looking at the impact of uh, arts practice and the way independent artists will, will really uh, develop their future practice post-pandemic. The pandemic had a huge impact on all communities and artists were impacted severely. Um, we commissioned a group of artists around the world, which we called the Future Fellows, to create manifestos about how they saw the future of independent arts practice without the structural support of arts institutions and how they could develop approaches to sustainability and an ongoing independent practice. So this session is really an extension of that thinking. Uh, we have the ArtsLink International Fellows here today and we are really diving into some of the ideas that the manifestos proposed. If you're curious about the manifestos, they're all on our website on the ArtsLink Assembly 2021 page. I'm delighted that this session will be moderated by Kendall Henry. Kendall is both an artist but also the leader of public art in, the, in New York City and a longtime collaborator with ArtsLink. Uh, so Kendall, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, it's, it's great to be sitting here with all of you. Um, and before we really get into our conversation, um, one of the things that, uh, as Simon mentioned, we, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and, and that has really has a, an effect on a lot of us. And I just want to start by asking, how are you? You know, how are you doing? You know, because as artists are always, um, you know, anybody is always, you know, doing what, what it is that do and, and sometimes nobody ever asks. So I'm asking, and um, I'm asking all of you, how are you? Very good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how have you coped with, with this past year? How is it, how, what effect has it had on you emotionally before we go into talking about the art, you know? Um, so I think that's important for us to, to sort of put out there. My first travel, mm -hmm. somewhere, by plane, during the year. My first travel to in, in 2020 it was fantastic. Yeah, it was crazy time because it was kind of stressful when you <coughs> get used to have audience, you get used to play big concerts or meet people, but you had to stay like one year just at one place. It was kind of stressful and uh, we thought, I thought that arts will never be the same that people will forget about this and uh, but it was kind of opposite situation uh, arts was the one thing that actually helped people to survive mm. that's what i felt yes well i totally agree with you we we had the same in egypt it was really stressful and but people somehow artists become very creative and they decided to do these creative pieces online and in order to connect to their audience. So it was really amazing what happened during the pandemic because somehow we explored different and new um, ideas and platforms. Uh, and now, I think from like six months ago, we began to open our spaces again and um, have this, or we can say, begin to build a rebuild our connection again personally with a limited number of audience, of course, but we are trying again to continue our work. So Iman, you and Ashat are, are sort of dependent on an audience as, as a musician, as an actor, yeah. um, so that, that might have affected you even more so that, that you can't communicate, because it's you, that energy in, in the theater, in the space, is, is what drives you sometimes, I would assume. And yes, so totally. that would probably um, will affect you uh, much more. But for those of you who are working individually as independent artists, how has that been? 
uh, for you in the past year and, and change? I'm afraid to be mean to some of other people, but I understood that all time I was not current. <laughs> because I didn't feel really big changes because I do live in a village, I always work in a studio. So it was probably easy for me to accept this new reality and I was prepared. Mm -hmm. No, you're lucky. <laughs> I know. This is, I'm afraid to say this. Just forgive me, people who have experienced it differently. Uh -huh. For me, as a visual artist, it's really hard to not catch all this visual information mm -hmm. from the outside and to be mm -hmm. uh, inside, indoors. And now, these days, I'm feeling very happy to be outside with you uh, and do art physically. Uh -huh. I think one of the positive things what the pandemia has done is like I feel like become more sensitive so but also like with like traveling or seeing an exhibition or performance alive or meeting a person uh, it's sort of like a more intense experience mm -hmm. because there's been too long the screen mm -hmm. <laughs> and I value that. For me, um, uh, my practice relies on gathering people and uh, creating tables of sharing food and sitting together. So somehow the pandemic was uh, was quite a moment for reflection. Mm -hmm. um, but as well, it, it had its good aspects because I was rethinking um, this need of us sitting together. Um, so I, I wanted to create tables with more um, intimate interaction. So I changed the number from 65 seated guests to 20. And that, um, I think, something that is really, um, it, it's a shift in my practice, but um, it took a pandemic to create that. <laughs> and, and so I'm hearing a lot of, um, and I've had the opportunity to speak to some of you uh, yesterday and about your practices, but um, how has that shifted? And for you, it's sort of like, you know, making it more intimate. And as a result of that, you've discovered, oh, this is a little better. But for the rest of you, particularly those of you who need an audience, um, how has that shifted this idea of you can't engage with a physical person? Um, how has it affected your work? And well, it's, it's deeply affected our work because, as you said, our work is really depending on, on having audience. And life arts, uh, can find very difficult, lots of difficulties to be performed online and digitally. But we are trying to, we try to adapt. We try to do workshops online. We try to have very small people or very amount small people in um, bigger rooms uh, so we can have this social distancing um, and try to continue working with them. It was difficult, but we are trying to do our best to survive mm -hmm. and continue our work. By the other hand, uh, in a stressful situation you have kind of extra strength and you need to think and find the way how to, to keep uh, doing what you do and we made some, uh, um, some amount of the online concerts and what I really realized, the technology now is on this kind of very high level and you can gather all people and you can see those people on a screen mm -hmm. and still play. And so like I was, it was the experience that I really live in the future now. So yes. And, and so did you have to change your content um, for that platform a little bit uh, to sort of make it work? And Actually, no. Uh, we did what we do. Uh, we played music, but it was the only the only problem was with the you know internet and technical things. But uh, the content was the same. And what about one sharing a meal? I mean, mm -hmm. the idea of sitting around a table and eating and mm -hmm. smelling the food and talking to the people and hearing the glasses yeah. clink and all these kind of things is is, is Thanksgiving's coming up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of what makes it like such a thing. So how, how has that changed? With, with For process? me, I was exploring other mediums. So mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, exploring writing more during the pandemic, because I couldn't, you know. It's, uh, 
you need the physical presence of people, you need people to taste, and that technology didn't offer. (laughs) 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 So, um, yeah, I was exploring other, um, like, writing, but ceramic making, and making all that as part of my practice with food. So it's not, um, so it's writing about food, and it's... um, uh, creating ceramics that are part of the eating experience after the pandemic. So it was lots of preparation for the moment when somehow we can gather again. Mm-hmm. Um, during the lockdown, I was giving more workshops. So I was focusing on the educational part of uh, because everybody was home. So I was creating those connections on Zoom where we were cooking together, talking around food. Uh, um, so creating these links over di- different kitchens all over the world. Um, for me, um, in the, when lockdown started, we just a few months as restarted the School of Contemporary Art Artists that was initiated by Murat Berchumarit and Gulnara Kismariba. Uh, so we, we just continue work on, with our students. And for all of us, it was very important because everyone had some kind of emotional you know support for each other so we felt like we are together so and that's why we just continue to work also with our students now because it was so strong you know effect on everyone and we were really staying together we had like our meetings every week and it's really like they were also transforming so they were like some of them even like left their jobs and became like artists. So <laughs> we was like, what we are doing actually? <laughs> so it, it was very important for all of us. It was a lot of Zoom meetings. And actually, video calls have become my guilty pleasure. Oh, oh you yeah. like that stuff? <laughs> yeah, but it's a secret. <laughs> Don't tell to anyone. Uh, yeah, um, when uh, Georgia in Georgia, exhibitions were like forbidden. In this period, I tried to expand my practice, did some site-specific works in public spaces like metro stations. And uh, for me, actually, pandemic was kind of a part of surviving, which really worked for me mm-hmm. to expand my practices. So, so Zoom was your guilty pleasure. We're not going to tell anybody. Yeah. Mm. But a, a lot of people saw it as um, for good or the, for bad reasons, whatever, saw it as an opportunity to reach new audiences, right? Mm-hmm. So, so all of a sudden, you don't have to travel to go to a concert or go to the theater. You could sit in your living room in your pajamas and, and experiencing the artwork. So how many of you um, see that, let's say, the after pandemic, you know, post COVID or whatever, if that's going to happen, uh, will sort of carry on doing some of those um, virtual programming well for me it's 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 become my future project mm. because somehow we we saw as an artist in Egypt um, the opportunities in the digital world and uh, that's why I decided to okay I need to explore more uh, understand this um, arena more and um, also to um, try to find the right format of what kind of art forms that we can present on this. Because we tried to um, present performances online. It was good for a while, but somehow we began to lose um, the interest of our audience because it's, it's a live connection, it's a live performances we cannot do all the time online. But maybe if we find the right format, something is written, um, uh, and be performed and presented for the digital platforms, it can work. Um, so this is my research now, and I'm trying to, to do this with my team in Egypt, uh, how we can explore this arena more. And in, in your research so far, and I know it's still in its early yeah. <laughs> phases, is, is there anything that's looking like it's, it's um, heading in a particular direction that will work, or it's... The timing. What does that mean? Um, the performance must not be long. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, we need to have shorter versions 
of performances, people really online don't have time uh -huh. to sit for two hours to see a performance. Mm -hmm. But maybe if they can have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they can do it. That short of time? Yeah, okay. for performance, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I would so, like to bring also one commentary, uh -huh. which is actually was such a brilliant uh, achievement. Even we couldn't, I mean, me and my colleagues imagine. So we did actually six hour Zoom meeting. Yeah, I know about with, that. <laughs> yes, with uh, different groups. There were right radicals, left people, intellectuals, like sophisticated. In the same room? In Zoom. So they were not dangerous, <laughs> you know, it was uh, so amazing. I would say if it would happen physically, it could be really problematic. And you just could uh, make the sound a bit less and then you're just absolutely comfortable to listen all this kind of uh, uh, discussion or argument, which became kind of um, interesting. And I must say that um, to bring groups from so far away, it's really possible in Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who else experienced a lot of new audiences? Um, um, we, have, we started actually, we wanted to make a sign about like pandemic and reflect in poetry, like collect different poetry pieces and also we added images. So we made like Zin uh, Aralash, that means, means fusion. And we published it, and after we really like it, and so now we start to publication program for almost all our projects. So if we have a big project, we made like also collecting, and it's like, and it's really like a journal with a like critical analysis with a good articles that we just produced together as a Bishkek School of Contemporary Art, and it. I think in, for our region it's very important because we don't have any like journal or contemporary art or something mm -hmm. like this. So these practices, uh, I think, very valuable and yeah, it, it makes. I think further we will publish a lot of books or something like this. So, but it started just from simple, you know, desire just to reflect on our like post-pandemic situation, pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so the other side of that, though, is you all artists. You, um, some of you have started organizations that support other artists, um, and and the platform. Um, how how do you deal with the uh, um, the financial aspect of or lack thereof? You know, to sort of offer programming and for free. Um, so, how 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 does the finances come into play with this stuff when you do a concert or you do a play or you do a dinner thing, you know, how does that work with it, within During that platform? Pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, there was a nice thing that people were paying for the time that you would spend on Zoom when you give a workshop. But then there was, um, I did an online residency that was supposed to be an actual one. And then, um, so there was this sensibility in institutions that they understood the position of artists at such mm -hmm. times and they were supporting. Uh, many grants came out for artists who want to produce something during the lockdown and they need um, some kind of support because there's still, you know, bills to pay and rents to be paid. So um, it was a moment, I think, for me that I that I, I saw the institutions that were doing this and I appreciated that, mm -hmm. the, the intention, even if I didn't apply, but just like this institution has the sensibility and it's you know, it's good to remember that. Uh, so, um, but for me personally, um, all the plans that I had for 2022 were moved to 2021. And then I had to work two years for one year. So it was a crazy time of work. And I think um, many artists had a very intense year of work in 2021 that was exhausting on uh, so many of us just because we were cramming everything. Everybody now wants to go and to perform and to do things and to gather people. Um, so um, there's this, you know, this break, but then there's exhaustion mm -hmm. after this break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, how do you deal with 
that aspect of it, particularly the ones and some of you with the organizations. For us, uh, it was very it was interesting because actually we don't have also galleries or like something that you can you know su can support artists and we don't have any governmental support. So I I feel that for us it was the same before pandemic because we don't have money mm -hmm. at all. I mean you know it's like no difference, but anyway, um, and we also I mean. If we present it like at exhibition, it's most of the time like not paid. I mean, it's our art scene. It's mostly do not earn money with the art. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was like not so big impact. But what we did, our uh, artists from Bishkek, they made an online platform to sell Central Asian art. So everyone can just put there what they want to sell, and it was also for some <coughs> artists. I know them, like, yeah, for them it was very helpful mm -hmm. because they can sell everything, and it was cheap, and it, you know, it was commitment of understanding. For example, like, someone buy, bought your work from uh, other countries, and they sent money, but work can be, you know, send it like in one hour, mm -hmm. or in one year, or, you know, it's when it comes, it's, I also have this work that I should already, you know, deliver after when we can, you know, manage this thing. I was uh, running an art residency during that time, um, and luckily it's a state-funded residency, so the funding didn't go anywhere, but uh, it, this place only makes sense when you keep engaging with the community. Um, so it can't just be only online programming. And then I think it was really tough because it was so much rescheduling. You just became like a master of rescheduling constantly. <laughs> but then you also became very fit. It was like a fitness. Like whenever there was possibility to open the doors, then you just went for it. And of course, we were lucky. but but you sort of adapted to this rhythm of the waves and the openings mm. and closings. Um, yeah. What was also really good, that people around uh, were a kind of understanding that uh, you don't have a possibility to, to, to play your music, to, to perform, and they were trying to help. Like, for example, we could focus on the recording and making some videos, and people from the recording studio made us like half price and things like that because they knew that well first of all they didn't have any work as, mm -hmm. as well but they knew that we cannot pay but it is very good time to focus on the recording because it takes time and uh, as soon as you cannot work and perform but you can record so yes and people kind of were contributing not money but like the facilities or the tools and things like that and it's really helped mm -hmm. it's really helped mm. uh, Mina, you, you, you talked about um, you're appreciating some of the institutions supporting the artists yeah. right? and um, there's this and that has happened quite a few places it happened here as well uh, but it was interesting when I was reading or uh, listening to some of the Future Fellows manifestos, it's sort of the separation between, from the institution with the artists and, and artists having to work on their own. And so I'm curious from all of you, what, 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 what is the role of the institution in your practice or what should the role of the institutions be in your practice? Or how should institutions support artists? There's three different kinds of questions there, but I'm just curious. Who wants to start? I can start. It depends <laughs> also what kind of institution, uh -huh. because it's a very important question, because sometimes it can be institution like Garage in Moscow that really like run with an So, so people who don't know what Garage is, so a museum, explain a little bit. Museum of Contemporary Art Garage uh -huh. in Moscow mm -hmm. that runs by Abramovich, like oligarch, and they have super horizontal relationship, uh, no, a vertical relationship, and they really using and exploiting art workers and if they do not like something they can just you know kick out the person that was my friend like he, he just you know threw them away without any kind of ethics and whatever and they also think like it's quite 
higher salary from Moscow, but they ask them do more, you know, they're really exploiting art, art workers. And uh, it can be like uh, institution like Hyde Park, uh, Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago, where I was uh, uh, for my residency. And they have really like, I mean, even like uh, structurally, it's like uh, vertical, but I mean, you feel very horizontal, like with all staff members, with all team. You feel like you know, like person-person relationship. That no one just put them higher than anyone, and they really support. They really care, and yeah, it's very you know, very comfortable to work with mm -hmm. them because you know you you trust each other, and you just have a main goal, you know, to make uh, this work better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and also if mm, like. In our country, it's mostly like self-organized institution, and it's also good. I mean, but they are quite small and very like vulnerable for any kind of financial questions because there is no any finance usually. So you should somehow manage this. Mm -hmm. So and so in our country, it we can say that uh, it is institution growing. It's like development. But I really don't want to uh, have something uh, like uh, opposite this uh, very toxic relationship in uh, art, uh, you know, art production, because it's really, you know, um, I, I met the, such kind of things a lot, like also um, Bach Foundation in Moscow. They also, they made like festival during like one year almost they were preparing festival about migrants and one day like one week before they just cancelled it mm -hmm. and they didn't inform participants i i saw it in like their facebook mm -hmm. you know it's very crucial uh, questions about institutions thank you for raising this but it really depends what what kind of institutions mm -hmm. yeah and and i know that some some institutions and i'm using that word that for institutions very broadly, um, think they're doing something good for the artists, but without asking the artists if that what they want. So again, I'm, I'm, this is, I think it's a very serious issue to sort of bring up, and um, particularly if, if um, those people who want to support artists are listening. So it's important for, I'm really curious, what, what does that look like for, for, for the institutions? For instance, um, I can make a commentary about German Fund who actually asked me and other two colleagues, they said, oh, we had to make a conference. It is not going to happen because pandemic. We have this Zoom. Maybe you can do something with this Zoom. And we suggested them to make kind of activistic uh, project to collect uh, different stories from different groups in Ukraine, how they actually less or more suffer of the pandemic. And then it became such a beautiful initiative, which is almost anthropological research, how different groups actually receive this challenge. And we are working till now on this project, and they found more and more money mm -hmm. and give us. And the moment we are preparing comics, which we uh, is going to do after interview with scientists, of course, about how immunity works, and uh, how vaccine actually works in body and all the story it's kind of in a very ironical way and then funny heroes which we invented for each this element of immune system so and this doctor said oh my god if i would be ministry of uh, <laughs> this uh, kind of uh, um, we, we got this uh, department new department in ukraine which is kind of defense the uh, um, problems uh, related to pandemic. I said, oh, I would hire you. Artists are really great, uh, actually, people to make society not polarized, but um, to make it more soft and create a platform to listen to everyone. For instance, just one example that in Ukraine it was like, oh, stay at home. And then we found out there are so many homeless people, they didn't have home. <coughs> how they could stay at home if their home is a city. So that's one of the examples. And we draw all of the stories and comics. Well, in my case, um, 
I had really good relationship with many institutions in the Arab uh, region and internationally. And some of the institutions, I never even had any cooperation between them. And they decided to support me and support my institution during the pandemic and the lockdown. And locally, um, one of uh, the collaborators I work with, which, which is a big institution that support us with giving us the space, um, during the pandemic, by the, at the end of the lockdown, they decided, although they decided not to open their space for events, but they wanted us to continue our work there. So they opened their space for us, um, of course, um, after using the um, precaution measurements, but they opened the space and they asked us, uh, okay, you can come and continue your work we are not opening for uh, events, so it will be like limited number of people in the mm -hmm. space, but you can come. So it's a kind of support as well. Also, uh, as Ashut was saying, um, there was like sharing resources from people, like from private uh, um, companies. Like I have many friends who work, have studios, and they decided, okay, we will share um, our resources with you, sometimes for free and sometimes for very low amount of money. And that was great during this time. Um, I think the pandemic really um, rises the, the, the empathy and the, the sense of sharing and loving between people. Mm -hmm. And everybody decided, okay, it's time that we need to be connected. It's time that we need to reflect and think more about uh, what we want to do in the future, and uh, it has to be together. Any any other? I can. Good. Now I I just want to underline. I think it's so important that every art institution would sort of reconfigure itself what it was before pandemic and now during or after, like you can't continue. There's just some moments in life or in the world like 9-11 or this pandemic where it's like, please don't continue the same way because the world has changed. And yeah, I just want to point out there was an amazing uh, residency from Finland, Kona Foundation, and they turned their whole system so that they let artists to turn their lockdown into a home residency. So they were funding artists to do a residency in their home, and I think that's like an amazing example. You just okay. have to trust, <laughs> because artists will keep working. It's not like now it's lockdown and now they're sleeping <coughs> at home. No, they are working <laughs> at home. Well, it sounds like Finland knows the value of artists, so and, and as a result, mm -hmm. supporting them, so. There's good examples. Um, oh, uh, my art usually, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually needs uh, money to produce <laughs> it. So uh, in this period, I had to take some money from institutions. Yeah, but sometimes I'm not I saying wish... it's a bad thing. We just try to find out. The yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but sometimes I wish to just live in the village and do music as Katya does, or go in the nature, just eat mushrooms and fruits, you know, mm -hmm. and just be uh, with the nature without any, any, anything else. Hmm. That sounds pretty good, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it was obvious that uh, in this sort of time, you cannot be just an artist or just a musician doing your music and that's it. It was all about the collaboration and supporting. Uh, so I think everyone uh, were understanding that and uh, we were supported by Embassy of Switzerland, who supports arts in our region. Um, and the project was to, because of, in, in many cities, the theaters, because of the pandemic, were dying. No one were like in the theaters. So we went with a kind of rock tour, but in the theaters. So people could come, uh, remember that there is a theater, still and um, but like enjoy also the music there so uh, it was everything was about the support so it yes that's why it was very 
you know, important. Mm -hmm. I would also say maybe that I agree with Anne that it's important to think what will happen now in post-pandemic. Uh, period because uh, during the pandemics, for example, I don't know if that was in the same case in your countries, but we were supported, artists received support from the government, which was great. Uh, so almost a year, you received like a basic salary. Uh, you didn't have this? You like no. what? No. <laughs> yeah, because like, for example, uh, I know for some countries that they didn't, but uh, in Slovenia it was the case, and I'm personally very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Some people thought that it's not enough. Of course, it depends on the expenses um, that you pay in life, but that was really good. To, like you could continue your work, and you received the, like a basic salary, which was the first time you know for the independent artist supported. Yeah, by everybody's looking at you like that, like mm. you know, weird, like because not not no, I don't yeah, think many people got that. Yeah, supported by Ministry of Culture. It was for the artists that are you know part of uh, supported in general or accepted uh, uh, to be part of uh, Ministry of Culture as independent artists. Not everybody is there, mm. but there's quite some people. I think two or three thousand. Uh, I mean, Slovenia is a small country. This, doesn't, <laughs> this number doesn't mean a lot to you. But anyways, that was really good. Uh -huh. uh, but now it stopped. So, and uh, in the case of uh, independent performers, uh, you know, performances drop down. So now I think it's a little bit more worrisome. What, uh, how things will go on because there are less performances, less concerts. Things really change in that field. Okay. I would like not to be mean to my country, to Ukraine. So we got a tax holiday. Artists. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also not bad. Tax. Mm -hmm. Tax holiday. So but no you taxes. should pay a lot of taxes. But anyway, we do. But so we could not pay this. It's again no, some support. For artists or for everyone? For artists, you had to apply what kind mm -hmm. of interpreter you have. It was depend what kind of activity you have. So this was. So it's only in Ukraine. Can you have this? No. <laughs> so surprised by what? I know that in Germany they really also like, support artists by just giving them salary. And in our country there was any, no any support. Sometimes no. they brought like some bags for, of food for poor people, but it was only things that they really supported for people, like in any kind of people. And yeah, uh, in from international organization who, with whom we work, like in Central Asia, a lot, only actually CSC Arts Things supported artists. They gave just oh, yes. some stipends for artists, and it was only one that they really, like, you know, well concerned. And Kendall, tell us how it was in New York City, how yes. it has changed. <clears throat> what, during the pandemic? Yeah, 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 yeah tell us. Um, so, <laughs> 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 so, so um, we had um, like a, a, a pot of like about $25 million that we, that artists could apply uh, for. It's called the artist, um, Art, the artist Core. And so these are like $5,000 grants. That artists could apply for through um, um, through, through NIFA, one of the art organizations, not for arts organizations here. Uh, the way it worked is um, that so so whatever an artist does, they have to have a public component, and that public component could be anything. It could be you have an exhibition of your work in your living room, or you could mm. sit in the corner of the street and sing a song or something to people. So it was very it was left very loose and open. So anybody could apply. Um, there was no, um, you didn't need to prove you're an artist um, necessarily. Uh, and then it went into a lottery, <coughs> and then you were given your five thousand dollars. Yeah. And was it like a lottery, like you know, it wasn't because, it, as you could imagine, there are thousands and thousands of artists here, and it came in waves in terms of the, the funding, and so we put it in a this pot, picked up the name. Five thousand was for the whole year, or for? It was a one-time thing. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. So which so, is not a lot in New York. That is not a lot in New York. Yeah. But um, but it was one of the little things that was done to to you know activate um, 
recognize that artists are, are suffering. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so when when you say what you did, what what happened, and <laughs> people are like what? <laughs> you know, know. So I mean, yeah, that basic income really helped. If you yeah, if you were part, I mean, there are still artists who are, didn't receive it, uh, mm -hmm. but many of us did. So I'm grateful for that. They saved us. So it was not so bad in that term because um, you could still work on your things mm -hmm. the whole year and you felt safe. But this is not the case now. This stopped, I think. When did this stop? I think in, uh, in June, I think. So, so what I'm hearing is it's very important that you know institutions and, and governments support artists, but in a way that allows them to do what it is that they do. You know, to to at that to some level, not not control content, mm -hmm. like what's happening in places like the garage or institutions like that, but just allow you to do what it is that you do because you know, arts is um, is very important to a cultural identity. But did the artists, for example, that didn't get the support in here in New York, did they shift the jobs or how do they survive? What? Well, it's always it's it's a, a thing. It's a challenge for artists to survive here anyway. You know, this is New York City, where you know the, the food is expensive, the rent is expensive, and and artists have something that we call dual rent. You know, if you have a studio and if you have your home, mm -hmm. you pay two types of rent. You know, and mm -hmm. if you don't have a studio, that limits the type of work you do. So there's a lot of complications in being an artist in New York. Um, you know, the city provides some support in in many different ways, like um, <coughs> subsidized, along with some. Um, Businesses subsidize studios uh, through programs, and um, and all these kinds of things. But it's it's never it's never going to be enough, right? Um, so during the pandemic, yes, a, a lot of artists suffered greatly, and and some of them have moved out, and only now people are beginning to come back slowly. Um, but what was really surprising is that there was a lot of opportunities as well uh, for artists to do work, and 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 artists took it upon themselves mostly to organize, which is again something that a lot of artists are deciding to do. You know, you know, they came together and you know they had artist talks in on Zoom. You know, I attended many of them throughout the throughout the pandemic and, and it was great because new audiences were, were gathered through those different formats, um, which is why I brought up that question, but it was fantastic. But yeah, you know, I, I think anybody need, we all need to do more, particularly those in, in cities where Culture is a huge part of it, and we do do a lot, but it's, it's, I don't think it's ever enough. It's going to be enough, so, yeah. Which brings us to your residencies. Um, so one of the things that, um, that's always curious about um, going to another country uh, is sort of like these preconceived ideas as to what those countries are, or those cities are, or how they operate. And I remember... Um, my first time in, in, in Russia was in all the way in 2005, uh, when most of my knowledge of Russia was from, you know, American propaganda. So <laughs> I, I didn't expect to see any, it's, to me it was going to be gray and, you know, there's like, you know, no young people anywhere. And, um, and to my pleasant surprise, you know, I landed in St. Petersburg and I'm like, what the? It was one of the most beautiful cities in, in the world to me, and and the population, the youth, and the energy is is incredible. Um, and I remember when I went to the Ukraine for the first time, which was just a few years ago now, uh, surprised by all the cats and the celebration of the cats in the Ukraine. Right? In Odessa, I don't know about the other cities, but um, but I'm like, okay. Um, so I'm I'm curious. Um, some of you in your residencies, this is the first time you've been to that city or been to the United States. Um, you know, what, what are some of the uh, preconceived ideas that you had and, um, and, and how that has that changed? Or what, what are some of the things you're like, oh, this is odd um, or interesting? You know, just to lighten it up for a little bit. So what, do you have any of those antidotes? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Austin, Texas. This was my first time there. And I was really impressed with, with the sky. Yeah. With the sky. With the a sky. lot of it. It's uh, <laughs> huge. <laughs> <laughs> Deepest. Uh -huh. So yeah, this is my like really big impression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I also lost this time in the US, but thank you to Hollywood that 
they gave us a lot of understanding and imaginary <laughs> that I'm in New York at almost deja vu. I was <laughs> here many times <laughs> before, but I was in Kansas mm. State and actually, I must say, America is so positive. Actually, in Kansas for sure, mm -hmm. such a sweet, not so mean and sour like people in Ukraine can be. Mostly all generation, I don't know, or they play, or they are like this, or they are just happy. So this is the first thing, pretty positive. And also, as far as I understood that, actually Kansas is very kind of uh, a lot of space. So I also couldn't imagine and. Um, areas, which mm -hmm. is actually not com compatible to, for instance, Ukrainian steppe, mm -hmm. which we have. So nature is different. So nature is not so much in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So I was impressed <laughs> to experience. And and when I was talking to you yesterday, you mentioned um, in the Ukraine you have an invasive species of plant that you, you saw it here in its natural environment and, and that was exciting to you. Yeah, was sure. Like, this is I came with this project because I was researching in Ukraine that some of invasive species were like in negative way called by my Ukrainian neighbors or American. Oh. Yeah, I just went to clean their reputation to see them peaceful uh -huh, here. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. I saw but I understood that there are also some um, native species in Ukraine, which is peaceful and we like them, and they are bad guys over here. Mm -hmm. So it goes both ways. Exactly, and actually it's funny that here also people say Russian, Russian mustard. Uh -huh. This is garlic <laughs> mustard, like to put all hate on the plant, which is actually they brought it here. In the botanical world it's called introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, actually a garlic mustard couldn't use a boat <laughs> and, you know, to be or fly, planning. take a flight. <laughs> yes, so, okay, but somebody could have seeds in the pocket, but uh -huh, still, uh -huh. it was not as garlic mustard <laughs> to be here. So, this is interesting phenomena how humans in general here in the United States and in Ukraine like not to have a responsibility of what they did mm -hmm. in the past. Okay. I want to hear more about that garlic mustard. Like, oh. <laughs> but uh, but any, anybody else had like really weird like oh, this is what happened here. <laughs> For me, it was the big diversity of how how big country is really, and um, I I felt like I'm not in one country but in different countries because I traveled like from Port Portland, uh, San Francisco, and. Um, Seattle, uh, Chicago, and New York, and for me it was like different countries, not different cities, mm -hmm. because people are so uh, different to each other, and they have like very, very different point of views, and um, um, yes, and it, it, this, and I felt, uh, and I felt strange because of that, and Wait, why, why strange? I don't know because, like, when you're in south somewhere in Europe, it's more or less like you you understand that you're in Czech Republic, mm -hmm. in in Brno or in in Prague, but you understand that you're in Czech Republic. But here you can go to the Chinatown, and there are some people who don't even speak English, mm -hmm. and this is kind of you know very contrast feeling. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It's interesting. I was. Uh in New York, I mean, I was already in the United States when we met <laughs> once uh, in uh, in New York for also our thing program. But in Chicago, I was in first time, and I think it's really changed my actually understanding first. But uh, the first thing I was really like impressed, I mean, like shocked that there is a very beautiful lake like Saad, Michigan. It's super beautiful and I, I really like to walk there, but I noticed that like signs that like park closes at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. So for me it's like first funny that like how park, <laughs> like all the like, like, like site can be closed. I was like, hmm, I want to see this actually. And 
I just started to ask people why why it's like closed. I mean, what is the reason actually? And people say that it like can be crime or something like this. So mm -hmm. actually, all people even like in Hyde Park, they then they it, do not go out after eleven. Uh, just do not because it's like dangerous and there were even like application about shootings and we mm -hmm. also like experience this in our neighborhood like a lot of shootings happen so for me it's a like very um, I don't know a lot of food for thinking because of like you know this you allowed to have the gun and what is means for your life because in our country it's very Difficult to imagine that like one guy just put to you gun, you know. Yeah, not here. And and here, is, you know, you can have it like on the, every step. I, I don't know. And people are actually really scared to go out like evening. And I mean, yeah, it's also I don't know because of like also social differences, like inequality, and also uh, I explore it after that there are some kind of urban racism, mm -hmm. you know, it's very tough for me just to listen because, for example, it's like uh, one neighborhood after another can be even just abandoned because uh, white people living and and local municipality just stop financing this, you know, and how it became, you know, like a slums or whatever. It's, I mean, it's very big issue now and I don't know how how it can even be possible now in the like, 21st century. So, so how has that experience, I'm going to go into your, um, your residency now in collaboration with the folks at Hyde Park, how has that knowledge influenced what, what you were doing there as a project? Uh, so I may, I'm working this, during this residency about food waste that, and all these systems that stand behind this food system because one sort of food produced like in the globally wasted mm -hmm. like normal food sometimes it's even like opened or you know the suit away especially here in the United States a lot of food wasted and I just, and I just took for, like one example very common for American to understand like Halloween pumpkin that like really wasted like in every like neighborhood tons of very healthy products that can be really it's really help us immune like very even like take out stress so it's very useful and healthy and people do not know like how to I mean they told me it's for carving it's not for eating yeah. you know? <laughs> so it, I, I I took the one big pumpkin from farmer garden for free because they can't sell it anymore because I mean, you know everybody everybody already took it and make some carving so and I prepared more than 10 items different from this pumpkin like you know cheesecake and monte and like marmalade like quiche with the uh, pumpkin and gargonzola so everything was delicious and they I, they eating in like don't believe me that it's like can be possible you know to produce and I work with a personal experience like existential experience when you just involve and after this you really you, everything changes you know so for me it was very important and uh, I also have some, I mean, residency uh, and col collaboration, communication with all people with different ages, different backgrounds, just gave me the idea that it's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. And thanks to my art, to my art practices, I can develop this, like, and it make me, it make people more understandable about this issue, and they try to behave in their like real life, not like artwork in the gallery space, they really act like differently. So for me, that's it's uh, the most important thing. I will not look at a Halloween pumpkin the same way again. Because <laughs> you're right, it's just it's just a whole bunch of, this is actually a food product that is just wasted. It's just thrown out as, you know. 
Um, so, so with the, with the other collaborations in your residencies, um, if you could talk a little bit about that, um, like what, what have you done? I know you've, you've been trying to solve the issue of, um, or explore research the issue of um, remote working, for example, and how has that been? Well, actually my residency was at La Mama Experimental mm -hmm. Theater, and it's a great place to begin my research there, especially that they began during the pandemic to do this hybrid model of doing digital um, um, work and present it online. And also, um, nowadays they have opened their space for physical performances. Um, and it was great trying to understand how they did that, what kind of technology they used, what kind of performances they uh, had to present online, and how to reconnect with their audience uh, for the physical performances. But not just La Mama, they were also, um, they were great to connect me with other um, institutions and companies here in New York who um, face the same uh, problems. And they are now trying to reconnect with their audience and how they are doing that. Um, and um, somehow the pandemic really changed perception of people and artists in this field because they they know now that they need to um, be connected to others in different way mm -hmm. not as they used to be and that's what's amazing and that's what I'm still uh, researching uh, for and trying to find new solutions and new um, formats for me to continue uh, online and physically so, so your residency wasn't necessarily about, you know, creating work to, you know, as a the theatrical work or whatever. It's sort of like now going to inform how you, um, how you work at this, t in, in this sort of type of time where people are separated and so it was a different yes. kind of... Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, back in my home, we, we really do lots of performances, different kind of art form, uh, forms for audience, but um, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, somehow things changed in this audience. Uh, people not stopped to uh, go to uh, see live performances, but somehow they're not interested as before. So how we are going to cultivate new audience and how we are going to reconnect with our old, uh, old audience, this is the research and this is the question we need to find an answer for. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so some of you, I'd like to hear more about your sort of residency experiences in terms of how, how has that collaboration um, informed the work that you're already doing, or how has it changed it? I can go. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, uh, my residency was in New York, and it's not the first time that I come here, so I came to a place that I know. But before I came to New York, I was in Iowa for a month working um, on the ceramic pieces that I uh, that I used in the performances that I did in New York, and that was a quite a special experience because it was the first time for me to go to the Midwest and experience that. Mm. I still had need time to process <laughs> that month, well, okay. um, uh, but I did lots That's of work. I was working. <laughs> It was, um, I managed to do, like, stay at the studio, work nine hours a day for a month. So that was beautiful. I had that experience, especially that in, in Ramallah, we don't have ceramic studios, and I still do not have my ceramic studio. So um, that was important. Um, and it would have been so expensive to do that in New York, so I had to go uh, there. Um, 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 my, my host institution is the Invisible Dog, and the director is... Um, Lucien Zayan, he's a, he's a chef, he cooks beautiful food, and he has uh, this table at his house, Salle à manger, Sam, and he hosts uh, dinners from time to time, smaller ones for 12 people. So my host was passionate about food, and we met before, and that really made the connection go fast, and for me, you know, just to jumpstart all the work and the performances and create all this... Um, vision that I had for those, for this exact format of table, smaller tables, um, and interaction with food and eating and ceramic pieces uh, that um, 
that are new somehow to my practice or introduced in a new way in my practice. Um, new audiences, um, but as well a new awareness that I felt uh, from the um, American audience to the issue of Palestine. And um, they know more now. And I think um, it was beautiful to witness that. I didn't need to go into basics uh, like before, especially that I spent time before the dinner happens with people, mm -hmm. and then people are seated and the performance happens and I talk to them afterwards. So I'm always curious to see, you know, like how people interact um, and how is the experience for them. And so, um, um, what else? <laughs> but, but, but you sort of introduced that topic through the idea of, of disappearing recipes. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's what that's saying. Yes, um, the, the, the research of my my project, Palestine Hosting Society, is uh, more focused on uh, um, on recipes from the Palestinian kitchen that are disappearing, and the stories about that disappearance, so, and how you know the map that keeps getting reconfigured contributes to the disappearance of recipes, uh, the movement of people, and uh, for Palestinians. Wow. Uh, this movement was mostly forced because of occupation and colonization throughout um, the recent occupation, but as well like the long history of colonization. I mean, we don't even remember the time when, when we had autonomy and we had control over our own resources. Um, and how does that shape? How does that shape what we eat and the way we see ourselves and how we act as well um, uh, and relate to? to all those issues. And my, 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 my gateway to all those questions that are very hard is food, mm -hmm. um, a medium that everybody loves and everybody can relate to. Um, so, so that's why um, I create those menus that are the structure for my performance. And I, um, um, and I do those in Palestine, but as well all over the world. And I structure the read performance in a way that speaks to people um, um, and speaks to issues that um, are global as well, but as well very specific to the Palestinian. Um, and I think the lockdown made people realize or or um, feel more connected to the idea of having, you know, this unfreedom of movement <coughs> that you cannot. And for us Palestinians, it was never a given. It was always part of our daily experience. Um, and we always created um, ways to go around that. And uh, so during the pandemic, it was um, yeah, it was a time for us to speak about our experiences. That yeah, and and so. I think almost all of you are, are deep delving into topics that are sometimes uncomfortable to discuss or sometimes need to be discussed, but you know, people don't know how to start that conversation on them and particularly here or you know, wherever. Um, and, and I think some of your projects sort of give a good entry into having being able to have that kind of discussion conversations and and uh, so Mishra, you had a, a project, one of the many projects you wanted to do. Uh, and one of the many that you actually did, um, that in a very clever way dealt with um, you know the border and immigration and that sort of thing. With the, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, uh, you mean the butterflies? The butterflies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, well, this this project was only for the butterflies. Let's say uh, I had this secret relationship with these insects. So many secrets. Huh? <laughs> I know, uh, and. Yeah, uh, I uh, have seeded and planted the specific plants all over the Austin and created a web to support their lives because these plants are the only food for these butterflies. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what was the plant? This is a native milkweed, which is the only food for the butterflies. And the Texas is the, one of the key uh, states uh, for the immigration from Mexico to uh, the U.S. Uh, so yeah, this project was only about me, butterflies and the city. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how I somehow connected mm, the Austin to, uh, to them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I had an, another project in Tex-Mex restaurant. It's, it was an art show 
and I was really excited about Tex-Mex, how uh, the concept of a Tex-Mex, which is like a uh, how two cultures like Mexican and American cultures are creating one uh, in this, and I think like culinary is uh, one of the human's great, greatest achievements. Uh, Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and food talks a lot about uh, all these cultural layers and I try to pull up some of the subjects out of them. Uh, and yeah, I did a couple of other projects which has uh, Connected, which is connecting you know, like six countries from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and Katja, you've been very quiet over there. I'm just really interested in what you've been doing with the with the Native Americans. In yeah, uh, my house was the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I work with poetry and music. I'm setting poetry to music and I'm focused on the interpretation and uh, delivery of poetry through music and through visuals mm -hmm. that I think expands the message and the, of poetry. So uh, I also work with uh, threatened languages and cultures, like my past project was based on gypsy poetry from Balkans and Eastern Europe and it brought me to native poetry and native uh, languages uh, and it was a very rich experience and uh, yeah I noticed there um, I mean I find this culture to be absolutely amazing and it has so much uh, wisdom to share concerning uh, environmental vis wisdom or human values mm. and I noticed also that languages uh, actually are threatened there because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a, apart from the institute where I heard few times only that students use the language in prayers or, you know, in greetings, they communicate, communicate in English. And in Santa Fe, I just noticed once that there were two uh, Navajo uh, women speaking in Navajo to each other. Otherwise, it's, it's English, which I think somehow should be protected. And here is my project is connected with that because next year starts a decade of uh, international uh, international decade of indigenous languages. So there's going to be many action uh, to persevere these languages, and I would like to be part of that. Mm -hmm. I hope so with the project. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, sort of this little lost languages and lost recipes and. Mm -hmm. You know, start preserving some of those histories that, that are just... Yeah, there. I think arts are for mm -hmm. that, no? It's important mm -hmm. to stress uh, the things and through arts, through music, through visuals, through I know, many things, so people can also be part of it and be aware of what is happening. So we, as an artist, I think we, we, we want to stress that and speak about these things that are beautiful and important. Mm -hmm. What a drama, right? <laughs> not even artists, just philosophers. <laughs> I know, yeah, I cannot speak for them because I'm not a philosopher. And um, Anne? One of the themes that I've been dealing with during my residency, so I did the double residency, the first part in Triangle Arts Association in New York, and then Grand Central Arts Center in Santa Ana, California. And one of the themes that I've been following and dealing with is uh, migration, uh, following my own great-granduncle who migrated here um, last century. So, and through that I noticed or started to think about the global economy and how we created this system for us and basically the big part of that uh, is when the invention of a container was introduced. Um, so I've been looking at the port areas here, at the uh, uh, Staten Island area and New Jersey, and then also there is kind of like a spectacle in this moment on the Long Beach uh, on the west coast because uh, all the container ships are sort of piling up there and just idling in one spot, or, I don't know, many months probably. Um, and it, once again, it sort of makes me think what kind of world we have built up for ourselves 
one can lay on a couch and just order stuff from China, <laughs> and and how to like rethink this that actually, you know, also the way not to like overcome the pandemia is like keep expanding and keep the economy going or making it grow, but somehow uh, start to take less space. Um, yeah, maybe it's very Eastern European thinking, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's something I, I've sort of been concerned with um, based on the spaces I've been spending my time. Okay. Asha, how, how has your residency done? Yeah, for me it was uh, very important to have the experience of being involved in art life in different cities uh, in USA to feel the diversity and to understand also um, to have some challenge uh, for myself to understand what kind of things I can do being in different country, in different culture. Um, one of the challenges was uh, my host organization was in Portland and um, one of the challenges was to create uh, poetry in uh, English language which is um, it is, is not my uh, native language <coughs> and also the style in kind of American style American poetry and we did collaboration with uh, Mamie Takahashi who is who was my curator and she's also artist and she made a, a kind of passport shape uh, poetry book uh, where I put my my poetry and it's also kind of the issue for my country because somehow every time you need to um, uh, to explain that you are artist, that you are poet, to prove somehow that. So it was kind of the symbol that I will have the finally I will have the passport and I can show it to everyone that I am the real poet and like I was here and people think about me as a poet. So and but um, uh, also we did some collaboration with uh, Portland-based uh, artists, uh, musicians. We made a, a video film for about the idea of decay. So um, I brought I brought some um, um, uh, videos from Uzbekistan about the RLC, the Dead Sea that we have, that kind of natural disaster. And um, the artist, he uh, did some shooting, uh, video shooting of the um, Portland, where a lot of homeless people also live, and we mixed it. Uh, and so it was the ideas of the decay, the, spe the specific sort of the time. So we developed it and we made the musical also uh, collaboration, we showed the movie and uh, the soundtrack in a kind of post-rock style. So yes, and in Chicago I uh, had a collaboration with a DJ who plays the Japanese pop music of 80s and I myself also a Japanese translator and that was very interesting because like in uh, America, there is a lot of people who are, uh, who has the interest in different cultures and like in Japanese culture as well and it was very interesting experience that uh, my knowledge of Japanese I could use it here uh, doing the, some collaborations with people uh, with American artists as well well, for me, the the main uh, idea and the main thing uh, about the um, uh, fellowship was, I call it mutations. So it's like the origin of the apple. Apple was like very small and sour, but as people were traveling around the world with their animals, they eat the apple and... Um, Apple were mutating all the time because of 
climate changing and places were changing and now we have like bread and sweet apple so i feel myself like this apple who were like mutating all the time moving from place to place having some this kind of experiences as the mutations and i mutated into the now i'm sweet kind of. <laughs> you are <laughs> thank you <laughs> That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, so we're getting um, quite a few questions from the people who are looking at this right now. And so I'm going to start asking them. And um, they're quite interesting questions. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I will start with this one. Um, um, so, so the question is, So I think it's, it means why do communities need artists? Mm -hmm. Why communities need, need artists? Why do the people that you serve need you? I think uh, because... Um, that was loud. Just quickly yeah. discuss. <laughs> 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 yeah, because I'm working actually with communities, you know. Uh, for example, actually my residency here was like one of the part of very our big project, Trash Festival. So we started in spring and we will finish it in December with a publication. So it's also about environmental issues. And we first we had like online, but then we went to the community in Bishkek, like landfill. We have this landfill, like very huge. And you know, it's like 50 hectares of burning constantly trash and we made the eco festival just in the neighborhood that like there so it's it's very um, and there are i mean people living there with a, it's can you can't breathe there actually it's very toxic polluted air and there is nothing even our government we wanted to pay attention to the problem of actually this landfill because our government took 22 million euro that's like a huge amount of money for our country and to close this landfill and it's still like 10 years it's burning mm -hmm. and growing so and we opened like we made festivals there and we opened community centers there mostly for children and these children never saw something like this, and we call it library of safe books. So we made a creative library because there is nothing like to, as a public space, public, you know, access to any kind of culture. There is even no school. They have to walk to, to another district, you know, and it's very sad situation and, you know, and it's also about inequality, mm -hmm. about environmental inequality, because, you know, it, it's 20 minutes drive from city center when we have like park and squares and also very polluted air, but there like much more. And like what, what actually I, I am like as a creator uh, and culture worker can deal with this, you know, and I try to transform and actually it's my like also protest those but also I'm showing other alternative ways how we can actually deal with this you know and of course the government should do this but I mean it's not happening and also like no any cultural institution or someone or social do not do this and we made this project as like you know against of everything mm -hmm. you know you, like you just do what and we actually we didn't want to do this i mean we didn't even think about this but when we started to explore the area just to speak with people they we understand that there is nothing like you know for children and for anyone they have only three masks there and sometimes children learn there like Arabic language, and that the only thing that they have there, and it's uh, very important that we can bring a lot of 
you know, support them and also to show them that world is different, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, actually, yeah, as how my art really transformed it. In, and also, for example, when I work with uh, wasting food, it's also not about like my personal, you know, it's only also about community. When, for example, we also have these leftovers, everything go to city dump, and it's constantly burning. So we need somehow rise uh, knowledge to like, you know, to work with the people to create this community who can resist to all these situations. So, and how it happened. So we started just from food, for we made now making now lessons, uh, English lessons for children. But it's just about building communities, you know, to bring people together. Yeah, so, so you know, everything that you're describing there, you know, and you're coming to it as, as an artist, but you're sort of doing the work as many different other government and other folks that needs to be doing that. So you, an artist as facilitator, artist as, you know, you know yeah, social it's, engager, whatever, yeah. it's, it's super important. Yeah, I think it's also because I'm actually a like political scientist and I'm working with analytics of urban environmental issues. So mm -hmm. it's really, I mean, you know, like extra power and extra knowledge to do this because not all artists can do actually like to read like laws and supposed uh, like amendments to the law. So it's, I just uh, exploiting also my knowledges. Mm -hmm. And we also work with uh, like activists who make some petition on it. I mean, it's really, you know, like a multi-level process. It can be not only art or like some kind of workshops or only activism, or just research. So it's like we, I just put everything there, what I But, but I, think, I think you, yeah. you are, you are sort of redefining what it means to be an artist as well, and what an artist looks like. And I think when, when somebody asks uh, that question of, you know, why do communities need artists, it's, it's not just to make the walls pretty and to sort of make things interesting, but it's sort of like to really care for the, the community and, and sort of be that advocate and, and be the person that's actually going to do the work and um, so I think that you answered it in a very you know, fascinating way mm -hmm. and as, as a way of this is why this is why people need art. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wants to take that one before I go on to the next one? Artist is the doctor for the community I think because well usually I also ask this kind of question but it's more about poetry why people need poetry mm -hmm. Because like you can survive without poetry, and uh, my answer usually is like the it's more metaphysical. But uh, the poetry talks in the language of the soul, and the soul is immortal. So and um, it's this language is much more uh, sharp, and then than ma mathematics or something else. And it's very important to remember things that are hidden and they're beyond our reality. And I think like everyone in the in, in at least once in the life were experiencing something beyond, like or having the uh, will to do some poetry or art piece or something else. And without art, without poetry, without anything else, that, that's something that makes us the human, really, the, the real ones. Uh, without it, we will be somewhere, someone else, but not the, the, the human, the 100% human. So that's, that's, that's the answer. That's my answer. That's my answer, too. <laughs> <laughs> Artists are the soul of the society, people. Soul. You can't live without, without a soul. Preaching to the converted here, of course. Um, so let's get another question. Uh, why is it important for you to network with artists in other places and other countries? Why is that important? Basically, why is it important for you to be at this residency? For the mutations. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet apples. <laughs> Uh, but do I have an answer? Because uh, I needed here in the United States actually scientist, American scientist, the 
because I am very based on research and my host the University of Kansas it was a rich place mm -hmm. to meet uh, different uh, scientists you know that you develop my topic which is on the plant world it's clear that if you notice you can't have knowledge of everything on the biology on anthropology on other kind of things but if you get idea you believe that something is over there you should um, involve people who also spend a lot of time researching this topic, calibrate in a different way and find the space and being more listening. So this is also kind of a very interesting role for artists, observe, listening, kind of interesting because uh, at the moment now, like it looks like there are so much of information but uh, to do this um, job, to find this type of information, which is not actually in Google, <laughs> artists can provide this uh, very unique, or in a unique way, this type of information. So I needed to uh, actually scientist mm -hmm. here. But I also think that, I, I, again, people, um, I think artists have this sort of way of thinking or the way of seeing that could collaborate with any field, right? Mm -hmm. Scientists with sports, I don't even know, uh, and then create something new as a result of that that's even more special and interesting or, or, or help resolve or solve a problem that another field might have and just, just needing a different way of, of processing that and artists can do that really well. And I was very welcomed by scientific world because I was invited by um, postdoc from Department of Environmental Studies and KU to his students and he showed me, oh look, and the artist, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's very important you to know that there are this type of people to work maybe with them just first or second year students. Yeah, it was interesting to talk to them. They didn't expect that they would receive an artist. And that they... Pleasant surprise, I would yeah. say. Pleasant surprise. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else, how, how, you know, what's the value in this, sort of this collaboration? I think uh, still the idea is quite common for some people that artists are the pe are the people with great ideas, original ideas. They're these geniuses with like big highlights. Where's the lie? Uh, I don't believe <laughs> in this. I'm coming from the field of performing arts, and it's all about collaboration and the matter of like how many, like to create interactions. And even if you're a super solo artist in your studio. Uh, I know many of them who are really great, they need studio visits. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. yes, that's how your work evolves and through these kind of conversations and feedback. So. Mm -hmm. I also have definitely answered. Okay. So, <laughs> if so. Okay, um, because I am working with the food waste and I mean just global environmental like issues on food and food production, so it's really global issue. I mean, it's not like in only Kyrgyzstan we have this problem. It's mm -hmm. really global system that, that like we have now, and we have like Kyrgyzstan like six million people, and we have United States like you know, and all like a lot of waste, food waste are actually here, and also this culture of wasting food. It's like in dominance, you know, in like Hollywood movie, or I mean, the the culture, uh, mass culture, the producing here, it's very also influence, you know, to what is going on now. So, I work with the also like political economy of food production. That means uh, food production and consumption. It's not only question of you know, of what we can eat. Actually, it's only politics behind and what kind of politics because uh, I met here uh, artists uh, who established Open Kitchen, Rudy and Alex and they really, I, I was telling that how like, uh, they asked me do you have some kind of um, local produce food or like do all restaurants have use it or like some shops I was like Almost all food in Kyrgyzstan just locally, <laughs> organically <laughs> produced. I mean, it's just you know people like going to the like tr uh, garden and picking 
the I don't know apricots or rosemaries, and that's all. That's mm -hmm. what what we have actually. And they were like, oh, what? <laughs> it's really like here. It's like up and down, you know. And I think it's very. I mean, actually, like eighty, only like ten big transnational corporations own like more than about eighty percent of global food market. And I think it's you know. Coca-Cola, one of them. So I mean, it's mostly like from here. So it's it's really important to research how it's here, you know. And it's even bringing me ideas that we and they just told that we live in a heaven actually, and sometimes we even do not understand it, you know. So that's very important to just to share, just to speak, just put what we have on the table and analyze. Actually, what I did for like first part of the research, I just asked people to write or draw what they're eating actually, you know, and analyze this. So that's why for me it was very like, crucially important to come here and I really want to continue to work. Well, for me, it's it's more about connection. I'm connecting to others and um, explaining more about. Um, giving them information about what they don't really know. Because, um, for example, here in New York, they don't really understand what's happening in Egypt, mm -hmm. in the art scene. So they needed to know this information. And we needed together to connect and build um, upon that and do like build these bridges of collaboration, of future co collaborations. Uh, so networking is it's about connecting and filling the gaps of lost information. And somebody asked a question about that. Mm. And the question is, what kinds of networks are useful to your practice? What Observing the sky. <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of networks? Who do you need to be in touch with? Who do you need to connect with that is important to your practice? It's very important to have, like, to be in touch with people the same as you, the same practice, like poets or musicians, because usually for many artists, uh, they have like extra large ego, mm -hmm. and you think you are the one, and you think you are the genius, and sometimes you can lose yourself in, in, in these thoughts, and it's very good when you are surrounded by this kind of genius too <laughs> and now so you can kind of compare uh -huh. how genius you are or maybe not or learn to be humble yes yeah, so learn to be humble so it's very important this kind of collaborations brings you uh, to understand what you can do and what people do what is in your possibilities and uh, actually when you see the real person, you can, like, I don't know, when I'm reading the, the classics and I cannot understand how they did it, but now I see the real guy and how he talks, how he behaves, and I think, oh, I can do that because he's like me uh -huh. and we are not that far from each other. So that's why for me it's very important to have this networking and to get to know other people, how they do, how they, they point of view as well. I really love to watch the creators, like the builders for instance, or the cooks. Uh, I think there is one step for them to become an artist. I think it's all about the metaphor we... Yeah, uh, but... <laughs> Yeah, for me, art is a metaphor when you create something uh, based on a metaphor. Uh, yeah, and I, I think I learn a lot from these creators who are really are, are like um, physically doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very uh, important to observe how they act. I think it's very important that like all we together so for me the most important maybe network like we are uh, our fellows because um, it's even hard to imagine how big art world like standing behind us and 
also when we like collaborate with each other, it also makes us more strongly and like it's it's make art more strongly and it, I think like more. I see. I, I was really like yeah. For me, it was very wonderful also to meet you all. Mm. Yeah. And I met you know, for five minutes, some of you, and I, I agree with that as well. Mm. Uh, next question. What do you need as artists to be able to advance your work? What do you need to advance your work? Communities. We need communities, and um, I think um, one thing that we as artists um, aspire to do with, through our work is to is to create spaces of listening or active listening to listen to each other and uh, to share because um, it's all about knowledge and assimilation of knowledge and sharing. You're not alone, mm -hmm. but there's many other issues in the world. Um, and how can you see the connections between those? And um, It's not only, um, yeah, you're not secluded. Um, um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you need as an artist to advance your work? Uh, the, the passageways and networks and, you know, a way like uh, see ArtsLink provided for us this gateway, mm -hmm. this ticket, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's creating a path that we from there can take uh, and create something out of it, just, you know. <clears throat> Who's going after that? That's a good answer, though. That's well, good you answer. need experience, I think, no? Experience and shifting your world mm -hmm. definitely so this so, so when you say experience you you um you need people to afford you the opportunity to experience things or or, or you have to look for you know the way to get to that experience mm -hmm. so like everything what we have here all of us in through arts link it's a uh, experience very strong one so how we got here mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean of course the organization help but we also had to push it to come here so I think you have to go for it and yeah also connecting with the artists helps a lot this is also experience experiencing each one of people here um, this expands your world so yeah but for me it's to be open to new possibilities to have creative ideas to overcome whatever is going to happen from two years, we didn't imagine the pandemic. We didn't know what, if we can ever uh, face this situation. But now we are talking about it. We lived it. Mm -hmm. So, and and we and there are lots of artists are creating these new ideas and creative ideas to continue and to um, to to reconnect with others. So it's for me, it's possibilities and ideas and creativity. And, and I, I've noticed that a lot of people are looking to the artists who have come to, towards the other end to see, oh, what are they doing and how can I learn from, from that experience as well? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay, next question. How do you see your work um, making a positive contribution to the communities where you work? How does your work make a positive contribution? You don't have to think hard well, about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, can, <laughs> I, I, I can just uh, uh, say the the example. Uh, when I started my um, performancing at the Poet, uh, I went to different um, cities and small towns in Uzbekistan uh, performing there. And after the performance, people were coming to me, uh, young people, and saying like, you know what, I'm also doing some poetry, but I don't know if it's good or not. I never performed. Well, can you give us a, a, advice? And it was many times, so I thought, well, there are so much people doing the, their arts, their, their poetry, but they don't know how to use it. And then I started the lab, kind of the laboratory where I did the open call and everyone could uh, apply it and um, uh, give their like poetry or what they do. And uh, then uh, this laboratory was in the end, we had the, they had the chance to perform, uh, uh, to perform their poetry from the stage. And it was like 
their first ever experience of being on the stage and some of the people found themselves that they want to do it more and uh, now there are like some even the, the communities of the poets they gather together they do some music together because I kind of connected them to the musicians and showed that there could be not only the poetry but you can mix it with music and visual arts so uh, yeah this is just an example how how my uh, my performances um, help some other people to understand what they want to do I mean just just by you being <coughs> is contributing to your to your communities every single one of your projects you know um, is contributing to not even your communities if in a global sense as well if, if, if it's shared so you know that that's an important question just so that you realize the importance of of who you are and what you do. That, that's, that's that. So I answered the question for you all. Because it's just, it's just, it's a given. It's a given. We cannot survive. A society cannot survive without artists. Yeah. 100%, yes. I have said it. It is true. I'm going to move on. Yeah. <laughs> and the last question we're going to have today is, um, I think it's a really good one, um, is how do you see, how do you see the future for you? Right? And, and for your communities post-pandemic, um, how, how do you see the future for you? What's in your futures? In bright colors. <laughs> <laughs> and sweet apples. <laughs> more voices as well. More, more voices. People, Elaborate yeah. on that. Yes, more people reclaiming their own voice, their own personal voice. And maybe the collective is part of it, but it's, it's, it's personal. It doesn't you know, suppress your own individual voice. And I, um, and I think... Uh, that what we can artists contribute is, is sometimes people forget that they have their own voice and then they can um, express it in different ways. And for me, in my own practice, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow dealing with the space of the kitchen and recipes, and that's a very strong voice that has been suppressed and not being shown in, um, in media um, as part of the Palestinian uh, story. So I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I want to hear more. Yeah, I also think that it's going to be in the future, like even more connecting uh, to each other, like the pandemic's has taught us. Um, and because in that way, uh, you are stronger um, and you know, people will not feel so alone. So there is a certain strength in that, that you are built uh, your own tribe globally. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, maybe I'm annoyed. <laughs> because I'm based on research and uh, trying to get understanding of different systems. As I just mentioned, the uh, system, how plants function, also about energy resources, also work with uh, war conflict to produce a lot of stuff about uh, Russian-Ukrainian war and also corruption, how it's sexually still exist and many things. I'm more and more sometimes set and kind of lonely and uh, for me it's uh, again to have more and more this kind of wisdom to accept and still trying to find um, new information, new knowledge, new discovery and also will be not so mean person, kind of not old granny. <laughs> um, so for me as you said, bright colors, it's like true, but true is also constructed. It's never can be one thing, it's always from which perspective you think, from touristic perspective or from mediator perspective or as a gardener, or for instance, the person who actually experiences things by your skin, by your smell. So I'm just looking, observing, trying to get information, and I don't have any forecast. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the future? <laughs> <laughs> I see the future of like continuing this journey of trying to understand who I am, like who I am as a woman or Estonian, Eastern European, somebody who is born in 1990 when the fall 
fell and Soviet Union break up um, and sort of um, how to understand it collectively and then how to localize these like big themes, like overwhelming themes like colonialism, decolonialism, what does that mean in a country that has been colonized constantly or and then another thought was like I will definitely see myself continuing these kind of exchanges, going to different communities. So yeah, how to make them to see and understand where I come and you know something some hybrid conversations that come from there. I'm going to hear from everybody, so. <laughs> well, for me, the future, I hope, it will be without visas, without mm. passports. <laughs> yeah. We will narrow the distance between each other, and we will build collaborations. Uh, I can work whatever I like. Um, I can perform anywhere in the world. This is the future for me. Uh, I see artists as a actually prototyping as people who prototyping the future. So I, I think it's very interesting to that we just bringing like imagining so actually imagination is actually what we only have. I mean, <laughs> like the most important. So we just imagine our future and like in harmony and we just bringing it and for me it's very important also like this shift in like reality because like what for example what we had in a pandemic that everyone have to work from the home but they really experience it that this that can be a bit like free you know and also do not go every day to work, you know, mm -hmm. just in this transport, like suffering from this transportation. Yeah. And now I, I heard a lot of people say like, no, I don't want to, you know, work as like, as m more, you know, I just want to have more time for myself. And I think it's uh, important just for me how the labor will be transformed I mean, all production. So just, you know, switch. It's like, it's kind of form of soft resistance for the system. You know, it's like not painful resistance when you just can, you know, just say no for something and it will bring some kind of positive um, changes. So for me, this is very important. Ashiko? Yeah, this last period showed us that the future could be very messy. Uh, I'm very looking forward, I can't wait to see the future. Uh, I, I hope it will come up with surprises in a positive way and I can't wait to uh, uh, adapt with that. Yeah, so I'm looking a very positive way. <laughs> For me, it's hard to think about the future. The time is passing by so quickly, so what is the future is now? I mean, <laughs> it's gonna pass by like this, I don't know <laughs> what to say. But, uh, I mean, I, for me, I think it's gonna be, I'm gonna follow the same path as I'm now. As I said before, maybe connecting more, because this is really inspiring, the connections more and more. And just uh, be focused on the same things that I'm doing now, which as artists I think we should do, like uh, to put the spotlight on the right subjects, mm -hmm. whether it is like, you know, uh, pointing out the things that are not working or inspiring, which I'm more inclined to. So putting the spotlight on the beauty and sharing beauty, which I think we all need more and more in the times that will come. So the beauty is important in sharing it. Good. And, and I said that was the last question, but I like um, <laughs> This is the last one. Um, so how might, the, how might you all um, maintain a connection that you made here? What, what, what needs to happen? How, how might that happen? That's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you, know, you sort of do these things and you sort of meet these people, you have had these collaborations, uh, and then it's, it's, it's done in a, in a 
for, for many different reasons in a limited time period. And as a result of that, you learn so much. You, you know, just talking to some of you I've known already. And um, so I think it's important to, to keep the connections, but sometimes it's, we have lives. So, so how, how, what, what, how can we maintain that? Collaborate. Keep collaborating. Yeah, do projects together. Yeah. That's how I'm keeping, I keep connecting with my friends from school times and mm -hmm. just try to work to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's a good idea. Simple but fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> because for artists, the work is like how you just are. Uh -huh. <laughs> you do what you create, your thing. So it's, yeah. I think this all looks like a train. Um, named desire <laughs> and I think we should desire all the greatest things in the future uh, all the good possibilities which will lead us to a greater world and on that note <laughs> <laughs> I think it also works like a principle of the library uh, like uh, you have all these people like like books and uh, you don't just forget these people because you're somewhere uh, in a different place, uh, but you keep it in, in mind and in different situation, you just can you know, remind someone who was doing some things and you can just email to the person. Like we done a project uh, in Odessa with Michiko together. And I, was, I always keep in mind that there is this kind of uh, great artist uh, and uh, if there would be a possibility I would love to make a project with him and uh, it was surprise that he also uh, was a, a fellow uh, here in America because I didn't know so yes and this kind of kind of, I, I mean that it, it's working by itself you don't need to do something specifically, but once you know the person, one you know what, what he's able to do, you think how to collaborate with him, and that's it. I think physical connection is very important. So in terms of collaborations, yes, but I notice if you're not from time to time, or this can be years, see the person physically, I mean, the connection gets lost, so whenever you can, um, so this includes travels, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, no video calls? I mean, <laughs> it's not Don't the break same. my heart. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same thing, no, still for me, I, I mm -hmm. perceive it like mm -hmm. that. The physical uh, meeting for me, it's important. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. meet. Yeah, let's yeah. meet. Let's yeah. <laughs> well, if, if I'm to be so bold, um, on behalf of CEC Arsenic, I want to thank you all for you know being such great um, artists, participants, collaborators in, in not just this, this, this talk, but in, in the residencies that you've, you've completed. Because again, I'm going to repeat it. Artists are the core and the most important in individuals in any society. And, and so this is a good example of that. Everything that you're doing, the topics that you're discussing, the issues that you're bringing up um, is, is so important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.